The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. We're in the 10th chapter. We'll soon be through. I say soon, I don't know what soon is, but... We've been studying chapters 8, 9, and 10 on the New Covenant. These are really important scriptures for New Covenant thinking. A lot of the, a lot of the confusion uh, in the Christian church about salvation and spirituality and things like that could be absolutely cleared up. If they understood chapters 8, 9, and 10, that's for sure. And so um, we've gone in and took a pretty heavy look at this because most of you people are, are friends with people in these churches that don't have a clue about this stuff. And so we want you to be well informed so that you can talk to people about these things. Well, we're in chapter 10. I want to go back to verses 1 through 4. Because I want to deal with the, with the word impossible in verse 4. The law, the Mosaic law, since it has only a shadow, that's where we get shadow Christology, of the good things to come, that's, that good, good things to come is what Christ will bring when he comes in his first advent uh, through, the, through the cross. Through the cross. Uh, no, I'm doing the best I can. Doing the best I can. I can't get more volume. Sorry about that. I can in a moment, maybe, if the Holy Spirit gets a hold of me. Right now, I'm not there. Uh, the, good, uh, the good things to come. It's, uh, if you're reading, why I'm just reading what's in the Scriptures. If you can't hear me, just read it. Uh, and not the very form of things. The shadow is part of the substance. It's a reflection of the substance. And the substance haven't come, but when it comes, good things will come with him. And not the very form of things can never, shadow Christology of old covenant, can never by the same sacrifices year after year, which they offer continually, make perfect those who draw near, will not complete their salvation program in the plan of God. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshiper, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of the sin of transgression? But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year, for it is impossible for the blood of goats and uh, bulls and goats to take away sin. Now, look at that word, impossible. Now, when God tells you something is impossible, it is impossible. <laughs> Okay, when I tell you something's impossible, it may not be impossible. All right, but when God tells you something's impossible, it is impossible. And that's what is kind of interesting that when you study the book of Hebrews, the word impossible becomes a very big word. And I'm going to show you four times it was used in the in the book of Hebrews. I'm going to show you four times it was used theologically. Four times this word impossible is stated by God about the old covenant, new covenant. And so uh, in a moment, now what we're going to talk about today is verse four, for it is impossible for the blood, shadow Christology, blood of animal sacrifice to take away sins. The completion of taking away sins is not going to come until Christ comes, dies on a cross, buried and raised from the dead. That's called the gospel under the new covenant. And the, it, the gospel in the old covenant was prophetic, that he would come, that he would die on a cross. And that's what shadow Christology was all about, It was to teach him that. Always pointing to Christ coming, right? Always now, when we study under the New Covenant, it points back to the historical event. But in the, in the Old Covenant, it pointed towards a prophetic event. Kind of like us, we point, when we talk about the blood of Christ, we point back 
And then when we talk prophetically about him, we talk about his second coming. So, but what I want to focus on tonight is the, it's impossible for animal sacrifices to take away sins. That, that's not what they were intended for. They were intended to show you that Christ would come one day and do that. That's what he would come and do. So I, I was thinking about this. So I wrote my introduction idea here. Uh, could you imagine living uh, with the uh, doctrinal idea year after year after year after year? This went on from Moses to the time of Christ. That's a long, <laughs> pretty long time. Could you imagine living with the doctrinal idea that in spite of all of your, all of your sacrificial offerings, there remained the impossibility of taking away your sin until Christ would come. I mean, it was all based on the prophetic coming of Christ that would complete that whole picture because that's a shadow, isn't it? It's a shadow. And it wasn't intended to be anything but if a shadow pointed to the substance, to what the shadow was reflecting, and that was Christ. Uh, so let's have a word of prayer. Let's have a word of prayer. And then we'll get into tonight's study. I gave you a moment of silence as a believer priest for preparation for classroom etiquette. Is that you can't study the Bible in carnality as a believer. Because it's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. And the Holy Spirit is that spiritual force in your life to teach you the truth of the word of God. You can't learn it in the flesh. Carnality is the flesh. How do, I, how do I know if I'm carnal evidence of personal sin? It could be mental attitude type of sins. It could, be, it could be overt sins or it could be sins of the tongue. You know if you've committed those. If you have, then what do I do about it? Because that's what, why your carnal evidence of carnality is personal sin, both by your conscience and by conviction of the Holy Spirit. Well, if you confess your sin, according to 1 John 1, 9, if you can confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. That restores you to spirituality, to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, who is the great teacher of truth of the word of God. I'm not that guy. I'm a teacher of it, but I'm not the guy that brings it into the reality of truth of your life. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I can take it from the pages of the scripture and the teaching moment to your mind. And then it becomes your responsibility and his responsibility to take it to your heart into a belief system. So that's very important. So I'm going to give you classroom etiquette and give me a moment in your priesthood to confess sin if necessary. Those who are, travel are with us by the internet tonight, uh, we require the same classroom etiquette even though you're at home. We don't want you to be distracted by, by a bunch of things in your home or wherever you are for the study of the word of God. And so, our Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come our way by the automobile and by the Internet. And we pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this lesson under the Old Covenant. That's Genesis to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is what we're talking about. Because there is when Christ, at the consummation of the ages, appeared to take away sins once for all. Once for all. Once for all time, from that point forward. And so we pray, Father, you teach us that tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I said the book of Hebrews is kind of interesting, this word. You, 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 in the book of Hebrews, you want to really pay attention to this word, impossible. I'm going to show you four times it's used in this book uh, to introduce uh, something that's impossible under the old covenant that's very possible. Uh, by grace under the new covenant. And so in Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verses one through six, this is introduced in verse four. If you have your Bibles, now you can, later you can do your reading on this. I just want to, pu I want to pull down to verse four. If I can get this six, uh, verse six. Verse six, I mean six, six. Good thing there's not a third one in it. I mean, 6-6. Six, six. And then have fallen away 
it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucified to the self the Son of God and put him to open shame. And he's talking about a believer who goes into reversionism because he won't respond to discipline when he is carnal. He's not responding to discipline. He's gone into reversionism and has become the enemy of the cross. That's what happens when you get into reversionism. Notice impossible. Then in um, the 10th tenth, uh, tenth chapter, we have this word used, of course, in verse 4. That's our text. And then in 11, if you go to chapter 11, in the first six verses, in verse 6, without faith, this is one that most people know, without faith it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of those who seek him. Okay? The word impossible is used uh, in these texts. And the one we're interested in, uh, in our study, is the 10th chapter, verse 4. Remember that we have seen this word before, um, adunatas, um, not able, impossible, not able. You don't have a power structure behind it. The divine power structure is not operating behind it in context. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats under the Mosaic law to take away sins. It was never intended to do that. It was intended to point to Christ. Because when Christ come, he would come and he would complete salvation in the plan of God. He would complete it. In the Old Testament, they looked for Christ to come. Isaiah 53 and 54. Isaiah 52, 53, 54. For, listen, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, we quote it all the time, but sometimes you forget that it says, talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, it says that he died on the cross for your sins according to the scriptures. He's talking about Old Testament. New Testament hadn't been canonized yet. He was buried and raised from the dead on the third day according to the scriptures. He's talking about the Old Testament. The Old Testament appointed to the coming of Christ who would die on a cross be buried and be raised on the third day. Abraham, in Galatians, the third chapter, verse 8, Abraham was saved by the prophetic gospel. So, and listen, man, how much more are you? I mean, what does a person have to do to be saved? He's got to believe that Jesus died for his sins, for his sins, and that's a personal issue. He died for your sins. Not everybody else's. Oh, I know he died, probably died for everybody, but not for me. Uh-uh. He died for everybody. He died to take care of the sin issue straight up and straight out. He died for your sins. He died for my sins. And when you get saved, it's because you understand that. That he died in your place. He died as substitute for you. So you, you, you've got to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day to give you everlasting life. You've got to believe it. You've got to believe it personally for your salvation. I'm not talking about just believe it. Well, I believe in Jesus came into the world and I believe he died on a cross. Yeah, but do you believe that he did that to redeem your life? Do, do you know that he did that so your life could be changed in time and eternity? Listen. Is your life being changed? How come your life is not being changed? I mean, you should be moving towards more the identity of Christ in your life and less identity with yourself. You know, we lose ourselves for a lot of reasons, don't we? I've seen people lose it over drugs and alcohol, business. I've seen people lose them. Their, I've seen them lose themselves over a whole lot of things over the years I've been in the ministry. But I tell you what he wants you to lose yourself over is Jesus Christ. Now you've done something really wonderful. Lose yourself over Jesus Christ. That's what, that's what the Christian life's all about. That's what the new covenant is about. Well, so my title of my lesson, The Impossibility of Taking Away Sins, comes from the 10th chapter, verse 4. I want to talk about four things tonight about the impossibility of Old Covenant shadow Christology 
blood uh, removing sin. Okay? The first thing I want to do is I, I want to call your attention to four homiletical points connected with this, with, with the 10th chapter, verse 4, on the impossibility of shadow Christology, blood, taking away, removing. What they mean by that is removing sin. In verse 1, in chapter 10, verse 1, it tells us that shadow Christology could never make perfect those who draw near, right? Never, never make them complete in the plan of God. As far as the whole business of Christ coming, dying on the cross, being all that business, could not do it. Never. In verse 2, we're told that these sacrifices would never cease to be offered until Christ came. Why, is that, why are they a shadow? Because of the substance. What did the shadow point to? The substance, right? Which was Christ. In verses 2 and 3, it says that as long as you practice this, it will never cleanse your conscience from sin. And don't you know that? People who claim to have the, that there's a step of the law in salvation like, like they did in Acts 15 where you got to believe the gospel and be circumcised in order to be saved, they never get it. They never get it. Romans 2, uh, Galatians 2.21, they never get it. They never get it. Because they believed he died, was buried and raised from the dead, but then think they have to do something to earn it. And that destroys grace. It's for by grace you're saved. It is for by grace, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It is for by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift. <clears throat> I can't tell you how many people that make that mistake. Listen, you're saved by grace. You live by grace and you'll die by grace. Whoa, you ought to be thankful for that. You ought to be thankful for it. That should be the message of the church to the world who needs to hear it, though, I tell you. In, in, uh, in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 2 and 3, it never cleanse your conscience from sin. And then verse 4, never take away sin. Never take it away. It wasn't intended to take it away. It was intended to tell you that it would be taken away completely once Christ came into the world. Were these people saved? Of course they were. But they had to come back every year and do that. Because of the consciousness of sin. You, you don't have to go back and get saved. Listen. I pastored a little church and every year we had a revival in the summertime. I tried to change that. We did, we did four one year. Just to get them out of a rhythm that you ought to do it once a year. Every year at a certain time. <clears throat> then I discovered how slowly we might change in the South. I discovered that right away. But we did that. And I'll tell you, invitation be given and 10 people come for them. Nine of them have been saved over and over and over and over and over and over. I would say, I would get, of course, I was really excited because I didn't know that. And then a, I, I would say, well, here we are. Let's, let's, uh, how about, we got 10 more new people. And they go like, Pastor, nine of them are on the roll. <laughs> And I go, like, how's that possible? <laughs> well, we get this air, and there was one family. We had, I mean, I was there four years, and, and they got, they, every year they came forward. And uh, try as I might, I never changed that deal. Try as I might. So, let me tell you, you don't have to do that. We're under the new covenant. You're saved. One sacrifice, one salvation forever. You, when you believe the gospel, you're in. <laughs> Whew, uh. This is why the old covenant shadow Christology sacrifices were continually a reminder of sin year after year after year. Why? Because sin had not been dealt with, finished. It was in a process. And it would not be completed in Christ till Christ died on that cross and when he said it is finished, it was finished. And it wasn't finished until he said it. And you know who he said that to? Who do you think he said it is finished and put it in the perfect tense? Because that word is in the perfect tense. 
He said it to God. The only one that understood that this thing was designed in eternity past and had now become completed, and he salutes him. He salutes him. It's not my will, but thy will be done. And he salutes him and said, Father, it's done. That's what that deal's about. And how important is that? How important is John 19.30? Should be dynamite because perfect tense means completed in the past results. It is completed forever. You and I, we come to that cross. That's a finished work. The teleestai to you too. Here's the second point. It was a reminder that Old Covenant Shadow Christology, that's what the O O C S C stands for. I just didn't want to type it out every time. It was a reminder that Old Covenant Shadow Christology was waiting, was waiting for the coming of the substance, Christ, which was sacrificially the offering of the blood of Christ once for all. Now, who set that program out? God in eternity past at Eternal Life Conference. And I, listen, please don't write me anymore off the internet about this stuff. Just go to Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. It will tell you before the foundation of the world, we're talking about the Eternal Life Conference. The things that were set up and established in the plan of God came out of eternity past before the foundation of the world. Okay? And I don't know how many times I say that. But anyhow, apparently not enough. My boy's not here tonight. He says I have to say it 10 times for him to get it. William does. And I, I, listen, I honor that. I honor that. It may take, listen, I've had things took me 100 times to get it. <laughs> the point is get it. <laughs> right? I don't care how many times you have to hear it, but at some point, get it. Get it and make it functional in your life. It, here is, here is uh, Hebrews 10.5. Over here is 10.5. It says, therefore, based on verses 1 through 4, remember that word, therefore. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifices and offerings thou hast desired, but a body thou hast prepared for me. First, first Peter 2.24 He's going to, that body, that perfect body of Jesus Christ as a sacrifice is going to bear the sins of the entire world. You talk about a tough day at the office, there's one. Six hours on the cross, three of them paying the penalty of sin. Whew. The sins of the entire world, past, present, future. I can't even phantom that. Probably had enough from any one of us to do a tough day, but the whole sins of the whole world. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 5, introduced how the coming of Jesus Christ into biblical history called the consummation of the ages in the 9th chapter, verse 26. In biblical history resolved the annual old covenant, shadow Christology, blood sacrifice that could never take away sins completely. They could never, the priest could never say at the end, Teleestai. The teleestai. He couldn't do that. Because Christ hadn't come to and died on a cross for our sins. Jesus said it and was done. There's the high priest. That guy said it and the teleestai was done. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, and it's a quote from Psalms 40, verse 6, according to the scriptures, right? That's Psalms 40, verse 6, he quoting in verse 5. When he comes into the world, he says, when he comes into the world, consummation of the ages, he says, sacrifice and offerings you have desired, but a body you have prepared for me. It's interesting. Uh, the NIV study Bible footnotes on Hebrews 10.1 says, the sacrifices prescribed by the law prefigured Christ's ultimate sacrifice. See, that's looking from the New Testament back. Thus, they were repeated year after year, the very repetition bearing testimony that the perfect sin removing sacrifice had not yet been offered. Hoo -ah. You got that one? Boy, that is right on the money. That is right on the money. They hit that thing on the nail on the head. Here's the point, point three. Old Covenant Shadow Christology offered annually 
were, were awaiting, the, the Andrew was, was awaiting the good things to come with Christ. And how we look at that is our pamphlet, 50 Things You Receive at Salvation. You can never lose in time and eternity because Christ gives it to you by grace, and it's a gift. And, and if, if, if you're not familiar with that, go to the website and pull down the 50 things, and you will see that. We broke it down into di different divisions of study. But that's really important. The Old Covenant Shadow Christology was a constant reminder, along with the consciousness of sins, of the hope of the coming of Christ. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, 9 and 10 says, Then he said, Behold, I've come to do your will. Boy, that was a big deal with Jesus in Gethsemane, wasn't it? Did he not wrestle with that in Gethsemane? Not your will, but my, right? Not my will, but your will be done. Uh, behold, I've come to do your will. And you're going to see what that will is as a perfect sacrifice. When he says, I've come to do your will, he's talking about, you'll see it in a moment, he's talking about becoming that perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world. You know, John introduces this idea on the wrath side of it in uh, 1 John 2.2 2, that, that Christ is the propitiation for, uh, the propitiation is appeasing the wrath of God. I mean, the ultimate judgment of sin. Think about that. The propitiation for our sins and not only for our sins, but the sins of the entire world. He used the word propitiation. See, most of the time you hear it, you hear the word justification, sanctification, you hear the word forgiveness, and those are all great words. John used a word that says, I want to tell you what, what, what you escape from in Christ. The wrath, judgment of the lake of fire. It's just an interesting how the writers, what, what they're pointing toward. And listen, that's a clue to what he's teaching in, in chapter 2. And it's a clue to where his mind is in chapter 4 and where he is in the book. Behold, I've come to do your will to take away the first, that's the old covenant, in order to establish the second, that's the new covenant. By this will, your will, by this will, talking about your will, by this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Watch this now, once for all. That's why it's teleestai. That's why it's finished. And listen, the day that you believe that Jesus died on that cross for your sins was buried and raised from the dead third, the day you believe that is the day it's finished for you. That, that, that deal is finished. All that sin issue in your life is kaput, is done. It is teleestai. It is finished. It is completed. God has saved your soul 100% in time and eternity based on the fact that you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift, not of works. Please understand that. Listen, when he died, he died for all of your sins, past, you personally. He died for all your sins, past, present, and future. When he died on the cross, he died for the sins, past, present, and future of the entire world. That's a big deal. You know, he didn't, didn't rush into the fire uh, just to save a, a dog or a couple people. He rushed in it to save, save an entire world, past, present, future. Think about that. Think about that when you think about what you're doing with your sin issues. Now, see this word, by, by this will, we have been sanctified through. Sanctified? Let me show you something. Now, now listen to me really closely. That's called a perfect periphrastic in the Greek language. Now, it sounds kind of big and important, doesn't it? Because it is. 
You, you don't see that when you read, we have been sanctified. Now, sanctified means set apart unto God, unto holiness, living a whole, be holy as God is holy, setting you aside to live a holy life in an unholy world, right? To be a light in a world of darkness. To be one who has been forgiven of sin where the rest of them are deep in their eyeballs in it. This is a, what we call a perfect paraphrastic, which means in the old, in the old day when they taught, I don't know, I don't know, when they used to really teach English, you had, a, you had a helping verbs. You had helping verbs. So this one has I me. It's a present active indicative. You can't see it because we have. So, it, and it's passive. We have. We have been. See the word been? We have been. And then the word sanctified. Have been is I me, present active indicative. Now it's attached, interlocked with this verb, this strong verb that is a perfect passive participle. Nominative plural neuter. And the perfect tense means completed in the past, the results or remains completed forever. That's what it means. He's talking about. We. Okay? It's not French. It's English. We. 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 If you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, you're in the we group. You're in the we group. If you are in the we group because you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ for your salvation, then you have been sanctified in the perfect tense by the passive voice and the participle of a theology of the new covenant. Which means sanctified, you've been set apart at the point you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. You've been set apart by God's program to be holy unto him. And as far as God, every time he looks at you, he sees the blood of Christ that made you holy. Now, please understand that. You understand that? Because the moment you believed, you became a child of God. You became a child. The moment you believed the gospel, you became a child of God. And when God sees you, he sees you as your child and he sees you in a perfect state of sanctification. You have been, you have been made holy by the work of Christ on the cross, burial and resurrection, you've been made holy. And the perfect tense says that God says to you, and here's my promise to you because you believed in my son's work on the cross. For you, you are, you are holy in my heart, in my mind, in my eyes forever. That's the perfect tense. And listen, wait, here's what I'm going to say, and that's my gift to you, honey. That's my gift to you. Or if you're a male, I guess you say, sir, I don't know. That's my gift to you. You've never gotten a gift ever in your life as big a deal as that. Because this is a gift that keeps on giving all the way through eternity. I remember getting a Schwinn bicycle. Whew, you know what that was like? Monday? That's a Cadillac in the bicycle business. Of course, Cadillac ain't much anymore, I guess, but it wasn't my day. And boy, I babied that thing. And that thing, that thing, I drove that, I rode that, not to college, but in college. And I don't leave that out. I put that sucker in my room every night. Because by then, the Swin bicycle had been worth something. That was a marvelous gift I got. It, it pales in comparison to what I got in Jesus Christ. Never gotten a gift like the what I got in him. Never. Never got a gift like that. Perfect passive. A perfect paraphrastic. Oh, boy. You have no idea how important that is to your soul. 
in the ninth chapter in verse 26 and then 28, he talked about the consummation of the age. Christ would come and it would be called the consummation of the age. Here's what it says. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the consummation of the ages, that is, Christ came into the world, died on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead. He has been manifested to take away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's 926 of Hebrews. So Christ, now we're into verse 28. So, <coughs> excuse me. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sin of many, will appear a second time for salvation, watch this, without reference to sin. You know why? Because the sin issue is what? Finished. It's teleestai. The teleestai. It's finished. When you get to the judgment seat of Christ, a big screen is not going to come down and point out all your mistakes and everything and go like, well, you know, you're a slug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, if a screen comes down at the judgment seat of Christ, it will have the gospel on it that Jesus Christ died for your sin and was buried and raised from the dead. Ain't that a good thing? Because this is not, has nothing. The judgment seat of Christ has nothing to do with sin. The cross has everything to do with it so that the judgment seat of Christ has nothing to do with it. Hoo -ah. Get excited about that. Pass the jug. That's something to get excited about. Romans 4, chapter verse 4 talks about the consummations in a different way. He says, at the, uh, at the proper time, Christ came into the world, born under the law, born by man, born by woman, right? Born by woman, not by man. Born by woman. In, uh, in, in uh, Romans 5, chapter verse 6, it says, at the right time, Christ came at the right time. See, all that's a consummation. All that falls under consummation of ages. Another, another uh, VIP study Bible footnote out of Hebrews 9.26 says that his Christ coming has ushered in the great messianic era towards which all history has moved. See, I tell you what we don't realize because we just were born into this whole deal. You don't realize what an influence Christianity that was birthed out of the, the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection, the influence it's had on human history since the consummation of the ages. That's why they call it that. That's the apex of human history. There are a lot of religions in the world, but nothing like Christianity. What kind of religion says to you, Christ came and died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, and if you believe it, you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Who, you want a piece of this action? Hey, then believe it. Then believe it and you got it. I mean, who, do, who offers that deal? No, you got to go through a series of pendants and all kinds of goofy stuff. See, I understand why they do that, but I can't understand why anybody would go through it. That would have been a red flag to me. You can get, get me go through all that, and then you want my money too? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Here's my final point. I know in your soul you're going, hoo -ah. Old Covenant Shadow Christology anticipated the ultimate finished sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross to take away our sins once for all. That is the message of the book of Hebrews. He pounds that so much, it's unbelievable. How many times have I said that already? I've, and I just went from chapter 8, 9, and 10. Boy, is this, are these not powerful? Are these, is this not powerful piece of, of Bible? Really, you really want to pay attention. Now, we'll be there later, but you want it not today. But Hebrews 10 10 and 11 and verse 18. Verse, verse 10 and 11 said, talking about the shadow Christology, which can never take away sins. Remember that was, can never take away sins. In verse 18. Now where forgiveness is no longer offered for sin. Now there's no more offer. I mean, there's no more offer for sin. 
It's, it's finished. No more offer for sin. I mean, you've been forgiven. Sit around and whine and grow. I don't know that I've been forgiven. Well, the word of God says you're forgiven. The word of God says you've been cleansed. The word of God says your sins are as far as from the east. As, listen, it's done. Jeez. Sit around and whine all the time about something that's not relevant. Do what? White as snow. Well, how do you know what snow is like? White as snow. Now, I got a real picture in my head about white as snow. Well, we had it in 96, didn't we? I got snowed in on that little road I was on. Well, anyhow. Uh, Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 12. By the by having one sacrifice for sins for all time, he was able to sit down at the right hand of God the Father. Look. One sacrifice for sin for all the time. For all time. I mean, is that not clear enough to understand that? I mean, how much clearer? I mean, I don't know how much clearer that could get. Or how about Hebrews 10, 14? For by one offering... He has perfected, that is completed, finished, perfect act of indicative for all time, those who are sanctified. How do I get sanctified? Point of salvation. Point of salvation. How about, how about John 1930 that we quoted? It is finished, perfect passive indicative. Or 1 John 2, 2, which we quoted, the propitiation for our sins and not only for ours only, but for those of the whole world. The whole world. The whole world. A Jew in Jerusalem died for the sins of the entire world. But he wasn't just any Jew. He was the son of God that came from a string of genetic seed, of messianic seeds that began with Adam, with their firstborn that lived, right? Seth. And then went to Shem. Then into the Abraham deal. I mean, it went, listen, it started. This thing was, high, was in high gear by the time Abraham came in and we had Jews in the world. I mean, we had Sethites and Shemites before we had Israelites. <clears throat> I mean, it's just dynamite stuff. Yeah. You see, I, I was amazed. After I got saved and talked to people who were anti-Semitic, Christians who were anti-Semitic, and I was like, that, that's an oxymoron. I mean, that, that, I went like, how, how can that be? You got saved by a Jew. How can that be? You got saved by a Jew. How is that possible? How was that possible? You get saved by a Jew. How is that possible? I don't know how that's possible. Titus 2.11 says, for the, gra by, by the, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Not some. All. All, all who want to believe. Right? It's a belief issue. If you want to believe it, you got it. If you don't want to believe it, why? Well, that's not going to be a good, that's not a good choice. That is not a good choice. Or Hebrews 10, 18, for where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. And then I gave you a lot of passage that well worth your reading because what you have in Christ dying on the cross for your sin is a mediator of the new covenant. You have the mediator of a new covenant to be identified. Well, let's have a word of prayer and we'll let the people off the internet out, then we'll do our prayer time. Uh, 
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way by automobile and by internet. What an enormous message the gospel is when it's preached by grace and not by law. When it's preached by law, the law bonds us. It should point us to Christ, but it doesn't because when we reject Christ, then it puts us into bondage. Bondage of the law. I pray today, Father, that people that have visited with us in this study would have an open mind to hear what the Holy Spirit is whispering into their heart. That they're the possibility of being saved by grace through God's loving grace and mercy offered through his son, Jesus Christ. Those who believe that he died for their sins was buried and raised with that third day would get into the kingdom. Jesus is the only way. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. No one. Doors open for everyone. I pray for that today. I pray that we have the courage to make that decision and then find that life in Christ that is so rewarding. Become an ambassador for Christ with the message of the gospel to a dying, lost, hurting, suffering world. Thank you for this opportunity, Father, to speak on your behalf in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, be sin for us.